application um, using one antibody, we essentially just draw a cutoff. If you're above that, you're positive. If you're below it, you're negative. So this is classification with spike. We can do the same thing for classification with the nucleoprotein. Again, if you're below the cutoff, you're negative. Above it, you're positive. But what if we want to use both of these me measurements together? Well, in this instance, instead of drawing one straight line, we essentially need to draw some sort of curve or decision surface and then use that to classify. So this is a two-dimensional example. And then you can imagine if you go into higher dimensions, if this is going to get slightly more complicated. And I'll come back in later on how we estimate these um, sort of curves using different statistics and machine learning techniques. Um, I'm going to show two applications. The first is an application to malaria for diagnosing and treating plasmodium vivax hypnozoids. And following that, we will show an application to coronavirus for detecting past infection with SARS-CoV-2. So the species of malaria that uh, we work with the most is plasmodium vivax. And plasmodium vivax is interesting because of its relapsing. Now, infection begins with a bite from a mosquito, which inoculates parasites into the skin. These then travel to the liver, and some of these undergo development immediately to give rise to an initial blood stage infection. And this is the paradigm for falciparum malaria, the species most common in Africa. One mosquito bite, one blood stage infection. However, for vivax, we also have these dormant liver stage parasites called hypnozoids, which remain in the liver for weeks, months, or years until they relapse to cause new blood stage infection. And the process continues until the, until the liver has cleared of hypnozoids. And this is the paradigm for vivax. One mosquito bite, many different blood stage infections. Now, these hypnozoids are impossible to detect directly with current diagnostics. They're also really difficult to treat. There's only one widely available drug called primaquin, which can be used to kill these hyp hypnozoids in the liver. But this is a very dangerous drug to use because it can cause episodes of hemolysis in some individuals and kill them. So it's a difficult drug to use. So it's not possible to detect these hypnozoids in the liver directly. So our strategy is an indirect approach whereby we look at primary blood stage infection just after the mosquito bite. Now that blood stage infection will induce an antibody response. Some of the antibodies are short-lived, some medium-lived, and some long-lived. So we can come along and take an antibody response, measure the, um, sorry, we can take a blood sample, measure the antibodies to different antigens, and then analyze these with a statistical algorithm to identify individuals with recent blood stage infection. And our hypothesis is that if we do this, we can identify the individuals carrying these hypnozoids, and then we can target them for better treatment. And in order to test this and validate this, we need to work with some epidemiological data. So here we use a classic study design in malaria epidemiology, where we have a prospective longitudinal cohort in a malaria endemic region. Now, the study design is to enroll a thousand healthy participants and follow them up for one year and take a blood sample every month. And we've implemented three of these cohorts in Thailand, Brazil, and the Solomon Islands. Now, from every blood sample, we do detection of malaria parasites using PCA. And this allows us to get a very detailed quantification of when individuals were infected with malaria parasites of different species. The next thing we did was we looked at the final time point and we took the serum from this blood sample and we measured antibody responses to multiple Vivax antigens, 60 in total. And what we're interested in is looking at the association between those measured antibody responses at the end of the cohort and the time since the previous infection. Now this individual was infected six months ago. Some individuals have more recent infection and some individuals have older infection. So the approach is to take the measurements of antibody response and use statistical inference methods and machine learning tools to identify 
combinations of these measurements of antibody responses that are associated with the time since infection. And we get a lot of very good hits. Um, I'm just going to show you our best hit, which is the antibody response to the reticulocyte binding protein. And this is a protein that the Vivax parasite uses to invade red blood cells. And this is our data. Um, so focusing in on the Thai data, we can see that individuals who are currently infected at the time we measured the antibody response have very high antibody levels. Individuals with recent infection, which we define to be in the last nine months, have slightly lower infection. Individuals with older infection have lower antibodies again. And individuals for which we detected no antibody responses have lower antibodies again. And this is a phenomenon that's repeated in Brazil and the Solomon Islands and in other studies that we've looked at. So what we want to do is use this measurement of the antibody response to identify individuals with recent infection. Again, where recent is defined as the last nine months. So the simplest thing we can do is just draw a single cutoff. And if you're above that, you're classified as being recently infected. And if you're below it, you're classified as having an old infection. Now, we can assess the performance of this quite simple method using a receiver operating characteristic curve, which looks at the trade-off between sensitivity and specificity. And here is the performance of the 60 antigens we tested. And again, we can see that our top hit of uh, reticulocyte binding protein stands out as our best antigen. So the next question is, can we combine the signal from multiple antigens together to get better classification performance? And the answer is yes, we can. Um, if we include more antigens, we can indeed get better classification performance. Shown here, we, can, we see that if we have a combination of up to five antigens, we can get up to 80% sensitivity and specificity. But there's a real problem with diminishing returns. And I'm not going into the statistical methods behind this, but in essence, it's using a statistical method such as the logistic regression or a machine learning tool such as a random forest algorithm that takes the continuous measurement of multiple antibody responses and spits out a yes or no answer. Um, so far, we've been implementing this in our lab using our Luminex um, machine, which I'll talk about later. But we're now also working um, with an Australian biotech company called Axon to develop this as a point of care um, test. And the aim is to kind of take this out of the lab and into the field close to where the cases of um, Vivax malaria actually are. And the aim of the, this is that we're also developing an application of how to best use um, this diagnostic tool. And this is something that we call Vivax serological testing and treatment. So the scenario is, if there's a population and we know that they have some malaria infection, um, we, want, we want to basically identify the infected individuals and treat the population so that we can better control malaria and potentially even eliminate it. Um, one strategy is called mass drug administration. So that's basically you give primaquin to every individual in the population so all of the individuals that you target, there's issues of coverage, which we will put aside for the time being, but it means that you'll treat everybody. It's very effective, but you're exposing a huge number of healthy and non-infected people to treatment with a dangerous drug. So there's quite a substantial amount of overtreatment with primaquin. Another strategy is to do something called mass screen and treat where we have a blood stage diagnostic. So if we look at these individuals in more detail, we can see that there's two types of infection. In orange is the hypnozoids in the liver, but these individuals also will have some blood stage parasites. And these blood stage parasites are easy to detect with a rapid diagnostic test. So if we apply a blood stage rapid diagnostic test, then we'll identify uh, most of the individuals with blood stage parasites. And then we can target these individuals for treatment and these will be effectively treated. But the challenge is this completely misses all of the individuals with um, liver stage parasites that are undetectable with these, um, with these um, diagnostic tests. 
So we're missing a lot of the people that need to be treated. It's a very safe method because we're really reducing the amount of drugs that are used, but it's not going to be very effective. So our approach is to find the sweet spot between these two strategies and use our serological methods to test these individuals and identify the individuals that have hypnozoids in the liver. So by doing this, we can effectively treat most of the individuals that, are, uh, that need to be treated and we avoid mass over-treatment of the population. Um, we're in the process of running um, individually randomized clinical trials to test out the effectiveness of the strategy. But in the interim, while we're waiting for these trials to run, we can also apply mathematical transmission models to assess the potential effectiveness of the strategy. And here, what we have done is create a mathematical model of how Vivex malaria is transmitted back and forth between humans and mosquitoes accounting for other factors such as relapses, age, heterogeneity and exposure, and the acquisition of immunity. Um, for those familiar with the uh, modeling literature, this is based on something called the ross MacDonald model. And then we can use this mathematical model to simulate what we would expect to see. So this is simulations based on data that we collected from a cohort in the Solomon Islands, where we followed people up over one year and measured for and measured their prevalence by PCR, as shown here by the red data points. And here we're simulating um, two rounds of um, population-based screening and treatment in 2020 and 2021. The first thing that, you see, that we see is that the mass screen and treat um, strategy, while it does cause a reduction in transmission, it's not a very effective intervention whereas the mass drug administration, where everybody is targeted, causes a much greater reduction. So that's the curve in black. And the curve in green shows the simulations from our strategy of serological testing and treatment, which we predict gives nearly as good an effect as mass drug administration. And we anticipate that this will get even more effective as we continue refining the development of our diagnostic tests. So um, the trials that we've been running for this have unfortunately been stalled and interrupted because of the ongoing COVID um, uh, pandemic and has caused a lot of disruptions to everybody's research. But a lot of these techniques can, be, can also be used for um, serological surveillance of other pathogens. So we turned these methods to look at detection of coronavirus. Now, the coronavirus exposes uh, multiple different proteins to the human immune system, and we can make antibodies to most of these. So we obtained a lot, multiple different um, SARS-CoV-2 antigens targeting spike, um, different um, subunits of spike, nucleoprotein, envelope, uh, membrane, and other targets. We also obtained antigens to the four seasonal coronaviruses, both um, spike and nucleoprotein, as well as antigens to a range of other pathogens, including respiratory pathogens and common vaccine preventable diseases. Now, with these, an with these antigens, we can measure antibodies of multiple different isotypes, including IgG, IgM, and IgA. And we can also do this in different sample types. Um, the main application is focused on blood, so that's either serum or plasma, but we've also been able to get this working very nicely in saliva, and you can also measure antibodies in stool, in nasal swabs, and quite a lot of different fluids. The saliva application is actually a very interesting one because it's just a much easier sample to take than blood. And we have we can put all of this together to develop multiplex diagnostic assays. So this work started with Jason Rosado in the lab, a PhD student in the team, who developed a 12plex assay for measuring IgG and IgM in the blood. And then this was taken forward by Stefan Pelot, um, a postdoc on the team who developed a 24plex assay for measuring IgG, IgM, and IgA in blood samples and saliva samples. 
Um, today, I'm going to show you some of the data from the 12plex assay. Um, in order to do this, we use a Luminex multiplex assay. So this is the MagPix machine that we use. It is a bead-based assay, um, which we quite like because of its multiplexing capacity. We, in a single small volume sample, uh, one microliter of serum, we can accurately measure antibody responses to 50 different antigens. Um, we run this on 96 well plates, so we can um, scale this up and have reasonably high throughput potential. Um, the cost is reasonable. Depending on how highly we multiplex, we, it costs one euro 50 to two euro 50 per sample. Um, in the first phase of the project, um, we were able to validate this on positive and negative samples. So by positive samples, I mean samples that were collected from individuals that had a, a PCR positive infection with SARS-CoV-2. And the negative samples were from various blood donors collected from 2019 and before the pandemic. And so we've done, so the data that I'm gonna show you is on these samples that are about 600. But uh, more recently in the lab, we're now running this in a much more high throughput fashion. And we are processing and analyzing the data, which is still ongoing. But we now have run this on approximately 5,000 samples and increasing every day. Um, so with a 12-plex assay and measuring IgG and IgM, we are measuring 24 different biomarkers. So this is too much data to look at in detail. So I'm going to focus in on our best hit. And this is the IgG response to the, the whole trimeric spike protein. And this was a protein that was made um, by the Structural Virology Unit here at Institute Pasteur. So it's a very good and high quality um, protein. And here on the left, we see that the individuals from the three positive panels of substantially higher antibody levels than the individuals from the three negative panels. And again, we can assess the classification performance of this by using a receiver operating characteristic analysis, which shows us the trade-off between sensitivity and specificity. So if we draw this cutoff here, this corresponds to a sensitivity and specificity of 97%. Um, alternatively, we could choose a lower cutoff to give a more sensitive test but there's a trade-off with specificity. And finally, we could choose a more specific test for bringing our cutoff up, but again, there's a trade-off with sensitivity. And every point, every cutoff will give us a different diagnostic test. And which test we want will depend on our epidemiological application. So it's worth thinking epidemiologically of what you want to do with the test. So if we consider this example of running a seroprevalence study, now, this square represents 100% of the population, and in red, we have the true prevalence of 8%. Now, if we apply an assay with 95% sensitivity and 90% specificity, we'll pick up 7.6% of the true positives, so in orange are the true positives that we call, but with 90% specificity, we have a big problem with false positives, so we end up diagnosing a lot of false positives. So in total, this would give us a measured prevalence of 16.8%, which is way too high. And we can run lots of different intuitive simulations like this, and indeed in a more statistically robust framework, which can show us that what we really want to be doing is prioritizing high specificity. So typically, this is why it's good to have a specificity target of about 99%. And our approach to getting high sensitivity and specificity is to measure antibody responses to multiple different antigens and build up what we call a serological signature of SARS-CoV-2 infection. So what we do is we apply a machine learning algorithm. This is just, um, the algorithm that we selected is something called a random forest, which um, works quite well. And this gives us a decision boundary like this, which classifies positive and negative. It's quite easy to visualize in two dimensions, but when we extrapolate to higher dimensions, it's, um, it works a bit like this. It's just harder to visualize on a slide. 
And now we can assess the classification performance of this using of these multiplex um, assay data and machine learning algorithms. And here is the rock curve. Um, you will notice that the curves are pushed right up into the top left hand corner in this region of high sensitivity and specificity. So I'm going to rescale the X and the Y axes so that we can see this region in a bit more detail. And the region that we're going to focus on is this particular region of high specificity. That is a specificity greater than 99% or alternatively one minus specificity less than 1%. So with one antigen, uh, the spike, we can get 91% sensitivity and 99% specificity. This will increase to 95% sensitivity with two antigens. And we can bring this up to 99% sensitivity and specificity when we use six antigens. And now this is slightly better classification performance than the monoplex assays from Roach and Abbott. But this isn't too surprising because this is a more difficult assay to implement and it's something that's been replicated by other academic groups. A very important caveat is that you should always be very skeptical of estimates of sensitivity and specificity, including from me, because they're always going to be dependent on validation samples. It's very easy to get high sensitivity if you're going into a hospital and getting serum from severely ill patients who have been in the hospital for a month. They're easy to do. What's much more difficult to do is diagnose individuals with mild or asymptomatic or older infections. And that's what we've been doing and it's what a lot of the other groups that are um, doing the robust validation of these assays are doing. So you need to always be skeptical of these estimates of sensitivity and specificity. Um, now, we're not just interested in doing this for the sake of developing a diagnostic test. We're interested in using this as a, um, as a tool to ask interesting scientific and epidemiological questions. And the problem that I'm most interested in is the problem of waning antibodies. Now, this is data from the SARS pandemic in 2003 where patients in Hong Kong were followed up over time for six years. And on the y-axis is the antibody response to spike. And you can see that over time, over the six years, there's a very substantial reduction in antibody responses. Now, in the current pandemic, this orange square is what we see now. We're seeing data from the first four, five, six months of the pandemic. And in some instances, we're seeing a very clear decay in antibody responses. In some other assays, we're not. But my fear is that we've got that SARS-CoV-2 is going to follow a very similar, um, a very similar trajectory to SARS-CoV-1. And that this waning of antibodies may lead to a problem of reduced diagnostic sensitivity. Now, there's been quite a lot of different reports of this happening where study teams have implemented um, consecutive seroprevalence surveys three months apart and found lower seroprevalence in, um, in the second survey. Now, this may be because of epidemiological study design, but it also may be because of this um, phenomenon. Um, so our hypothesis is that by using multiplex combinations of antibodies, this can provide a potential solution to this problem. And it may also give a further opportunity of allowing us to provide an estimation of time since infection. So in addition to just saying, were you infected, yes or no, it might be possible to say, were you infected three months ago? Were you infected last year? Were you infected two years ago? Um, now, this is something that we have validated in theory. So we have applied mathematical models of antibody kinetics to look at how antibody levels change over time. Um, but this isn't really a high enough standard of evidence. So we're also working to show that this works in practice. And with our team and others at Institute Pasteur, we're doing ongoing sample collection where we're collecting thousands of samples from individuals followed up longitudinally over time. 
And I'm sorry that I don't have the data to show you from this because we're literally still processing this in the, in the lab, but the indications are that these antibody responses are coming down detectably within the, the first six months. Now, this is the theoretical work from the mathematical models where we modeled out the antibody responses over time of spike, the receptor binding domain, and the nucleoprotein. And in order to do this, we had to use prior information from coronavirus, from SARS-CoV virus and the other seasonal coronaviruses, and apply that to our projections. Now, the red curve shows how, um, how sensitivity will change over time for a monoplex assay base, based on spike. So spike is, gives a slightly more stable response than nucleoprotein. And in particular, we would predict that within the first year, that sensitivity will start reducing substantially. And the other colored curves show the prediction using a, a multiplex assay. So the black curve in particular is the output from a fourplex assay based on IgG. And with this multiplex combination, we predict that we get higher sensitivity that remains higher for longer. Um, now, this is just with IgG. Um, you will get different patterns for IgM and IgA, which have slightly different um, kinetics. And um, the other application of this is we think that by, in particular, by pooling IgG, IgA, and IgM to different antigens, we can also ask the question of when individuals were infected. Um, so I'll finish by summing up by summarizing. Um, now, just some, again, some very general points that kind of unify the two applications. The first is that measurements of antibodies, they're continuous measurements. So, you know, it's a concentration. And very often people just simplify this into positive, negative. And when they do that, it's just drawing a cutoff. And if you're above the cutoff, you're positive. If you're below, if you're below it, you're negative. So that especially now in the coronavirus pandemic, there's been a lot of people saying that certain individuals don't have antibodies, but most of them do. It's just below this cutoff. And this dichotomizing of complex inter information causes us to lose a lot of information. Uh, the reality is quite complex and noisy, and we tend to usually have noisy and correlated and high dimensional data. But for if you work with good statisticians, this complexity is actually an advantage, at least for diagnostic applications, because with additional data, you can build better diagnostic tools. Um, and then I will finish by thanking you for your attention and leaving up my acknowledgement slides.